You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Brian Platzer. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. The Feisty Heroine Romance Collection of Short Stories. Over 30 plus pulse racing shorts to capture your art with USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and award-winning authors in the mix. Paranormal, contemporary, fantasy, and historical romance that will whet your appetite with titillating heart-pounding tales you'll want to read again, then beg for more. Fall in love with your next book crush. Pre-order this amazing collection of shorts, over 30 pulse-pounding stories for only 99 cents. Proceed with caution. Buying this collection may lead to addictive reading, falling in love with your next book crush, and staying up past your bedtime to see what happens next. Get your limited edition copy of Feisty Heroines. Look for the link in the show notes of this episode. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Carrie Mayer on the show with me. She's got a phenomenal new book. It's called The Girl in White Gloves, and this is an historical fiction um, that reads like like a, a complete page turner. Um, <laughs> I know you guys are really going to love it. So welcome to the show, Carrie. Thank you so much for having me, Hank. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. Um, Carrie, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, wow. What a great first question. Um, (sighs) I'm not sure I remember the exact first moment, but I can tell you I wrote my first unfinished novel in fifth grade. (laughs) <laughs> so it's been a long time. Um, and in fact, when I was in middle school, I wrote another unfinished novel and uh, uh, fancied myself sort of like Charles Dickens. And I would like write a, a chapter the night before and I would print it out on, you know, those printer papers that you had to like pull the the, the, the perforated edges off the sides <laughs> um, and circulate it around to all my friends and band the next morning. <laughs> so um, it's been a, it's been a while. I love that so much. Um, you were obviously a bookish kid. Um, what were what were some of the stories that captured your imagination early on? 
Well, you know, uh, um, serendipitously for this season, I loved Little Women when I was probably in uh, fourth grade. Um, that was one of my formative reads. Um, I also loved Jane Eyre. I liked the 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 um, the Jane Austen novels. Um, but I'm also not a snob. I loved the Sweet Valley High novels. <laughs> um, I would just devour those like candy. Um, so I read, you know, a whole variety of things growing up. Did um, as as a kid who would write and you know publish for your friends and and all of that stuff. Was there ever an adult who uh, maybe it was a teacher, maybe it was a parent who recognized this thing in you and gave you encouragement? Yes. So my parents have been always super supportive of me as a writer. I feel I'm very, very lucky in that regard. Um, and, and there were also teachers along the way as well. Um, I would say that I rem remember specifically my sixth grade teacher um, taking an interest in me. And I, I didn't go to a, uh, I went to a re regular elementary school for sixth grade, not a middle school. So she was like my teacher for all the subjects. And I don't remember exactly how she came to know that I would write sort of stories on the side. I think at the time I might have still been working on my, my unfinished fifth grade novel. But she actually asked, asked to read a few pages and she read them and was so complimentary and she gave me suggestions. Um, and I had a, I had a middle school English teacher who did something similar. Um, and then, but it was when I was in high school um, that I felt like I really started to get taken very seriously by a couple of teachers. I was um, on the high school newspaper um, and and the the faculty advisor for the newspaper really took me seriously as a writer, and which meant giving me hard feedback and 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 telling me things that would really improve my writing. The other teacher who really improved my writing and took my took me seriously in high school was my high school speech and debate coach. In California, there's an event in uh, speech and debate called Original Prose and Poetry, where the competitor writes a 10 minute story and then acts it out. And that was my favorite event. And, and I, I did pretty well with it. I did the best my junior year in high school. But, um, you know, that was where I really started to identify myself as a writer. So th there was never any doubt that, that you were going to take the writer path. Um, did, did you ever pursue anything else? Uh, you know, you know, like we all get the speech from from our parents or, or someone, you know, writing is wonderful. That's amazing. But you need to pay the bills. You need to have something to fall back on. Did you ever get that speech? Oh, yes. Um, actually, you know, I, not many people realize this because it's under a different name, but I wrote a little um, a sort of an advice driven memoir for young writers uh, um, under the name Carrie Majors um, called uh, this is not a writing manual. Right. And, and one of the chapters in that is, yes, you do have to get a real job. <laughs> um, because, you know, the road to um, being a writer is a, can be a very long one. And even when you arrive, so to speak, it's not necessarily going to pay your bills. Um, so all of that is true. Um, uh, I, I think that, I think I answered the question. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what what drove you to write that memoir? I did see that that you wrote that memoir. Um, what what was the uh, where were you in life when you decided to write that? So I um, that was about it came out about close to ten years ago. Okay, and I guess it was two thousand and three, so it was maybe seven or eight years ago. And so I I launched a literary journal called Yarn, the Young Adult Review Network, which was a literary journal for YA literature, and you know we did. Um, pretty well. Like we were recognized by the National Book Foundation um, and, uh, you know, got some attention for that. And I, I started to think of myself, I was also sort of between book projects at that point. I had had, I had written at that point, maybe three unpublished novels. I had an agent, you know, I had done a lot of things that uh, g gave me feedback that I was on the right path. But I kind of needed a break from writing itself. So um, with a group of friends of mine, I launched this literary journal and kind of put on my editing hat and realized that I really enjoyed that as well. Um, and I and I, I don't know, like uh, the beginning of Yarn and being an editor and kind of mentoring young writers to publication, I started thinking about my own self as a young writer um, and how I wish that there had been something uh, you know, other than the people telling me that I needed to have a real job, <laughs> um, some some help and advice 
um, for me as a young writer. So I sat down and tried the, to write the book I wish I had had as a 15 year old young writer. And so that's how that book came about. Gotcha. Um, do you, um, do, do you feel like that, that, that break, um, from pursuing your own writing and switching hats over to that sort of editorial side and then, uh, kind of, um, breaking the, the tunnel vision that, that maybe you had at the time. Do you think that that, um, op opened you up and, and eventually led to the success that you found? Absolutely. 100%. Sometimes the best writing you can do is not writing. <laughs> um, and in fact, you know, one, one of the things that I talk about in that book, um, and that I, I love talking about over coffee with, you know, young aspiring writers is, you know, the, the writing life is long. And, and you have to, if you're going to be a writer, you have to think about what are the things that about, about writing that make it worth doing for you. Um, because those are the things you're going to need to hold on to while you're, you know, essentially failing most of the time, you know, you get a lot of no as a writer. Um, I have five unpublished novels that will never see the light of day. <laughs> um, and I wouldn't trade that for anything. You know, I, you know, I tried my hand at a lot of different genres. Um, you know, I got an MFA in fiction writing. I also taught, you know, so in teaching writing for me provided a really terrific synergy with, um, with actually writing. Um, and, and I fell in with a group of really terrific like-minded writer teachers and like the conversations we would have about teaching and writing were just so fruitful for me. Um, so those, to me, all of that editing, teaching, um, are, are, are all part of the writing life. Right. Um, I, I know that you, um, pursued an MFA and I saw a video that you did and you talked about, you told this really great story about, being in the midst of your MFA pursuit and that things were just so serious. Uh, and you, uh, you took the summer off and, uh, sublet your apartment and uh, moved to California where you originally were from, I believe, and wrote a romance novel and just allowed yourself to have fun. Um, yes. Talk a little bit about that, please, because I, I kind of laughed out loud when I heard that story because I knew exactly. <laughs> what you meant by that. And, and I, I felt like I could commiserate with you. Um, sometimes, you know, we, we take ourselves too seriously and we take this whole writing thing too seriously. And, and we need to remember to connect back to the thing that made us want to be writers in the first place. Hardly anybody starts by wanting to be a super serious writer. Um, we want to tell stories that engage people and allow them to have a little escape and fun. Um, talk about that a little bit, if you would, please. Well, do you have an MFA? Now I'm curious. I, I don't, I don't, <laughs> but well, you know, you don't have to have an MFA to have, I think have this exact frustration and that, you know, that you're the describing, um, uh, you know, I, so yeah, I mean, I, I mean, listen, I wouldn't trade my MFA experience for the world. And I learned a great deal as a student, um, in the program. Um, but I have to say that that, when I decided to sort of take a summer to uh, write a romance novel, first of all, I have to tell you, the first thing I had to do was read some romance novels. Um, uh, and I, w I, I learned so much about plot and pacing and um, character development from, from reading those romance novels. Even the ones that were formulaic w were interesting and um, instructive to me. Um, and so I learned, you can learn about writing from any genre. Um, and it was, it was fun. You know, it, I had a great time. I, I, you know, I, I was at the time, so I let, sublet my apartment in, in Brooklyn and I lived for free, um, at my parents' summer home that was in Tahoe. <laughs> so that was nice. Um, and I just, I walk a dog and I wrote all day and it was really, it was, it was a real treat. Um, and I, like I said, I learned so much about the genre that way. Um, I also wrote, you know, I tried my hand at writing, um, um, mysteries. I am not a mystery. One of the things I learned there was I am not a mystery novelist. <laughs> um, I think your brain has to work in a much more kind of logical way in order to be a, a mystery novelist. I mean, I, I think the mystery novel I wrote was all right, but, um, 
you know, historical fiction is definitely where I was supposed to, to land. And it's sort of interesting to me that I, it took me so long to get here. Um, Cause it's funny, like a lot of things in life, you sort of arrive there and you're like, well, of course, <laughs> this is, of course, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, researching and writing historical fiction lit up parts of my brain that hadn't been lit up since college. Um, so I just love it. And and when you found it, it fit like a white glove. And it fit like a white glove. Stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the you you began uh, in the genre with um, with the Kennedy debutante. Um, what was it that? Uh, and, and you talked about you know knowing that when you got there, this is where you was you were supposed to be. What led you there? What led me to write uh, the girl in white gloves? No, well, the the Kennedy debutante for fun. Oh, I'm what, sorry. what brought you to historical fiction, uh, where you knew this is where you were supposed to be? Yeah, so uh, you know, I I um I read some historical fiction at, just as a re as a casual reader, um, and one of the like the books that I read that I just thought wow was um uh. The Paris Wife by Paula McLean about um, Hem Ernest Hemingway's first wife and their years in Paris. And I didn't read it and think to myself, wow, I want to do this. But, but what I thought to myself was, this is amazing. I, I can't believe that this can be done. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I feel like that novel is uh, was part of sort of this new generation of historical fiction that we're really seeing in full blossom right now. Um, um, but it wasn't until... I, the Downton Abbey era, did you watch Downton Abbey? Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> um, yes. So, okay. So um, I, you know, I watched Downton Abbey to the end. I absolutely loved it. And, um, you know, the, the, our local PBS station was airing a whole bunch of, you know, sort of Downton related shows. And one of them was called, it was a PBS or it was a, probably a BBC documentary series called Secrets of the Manor House. And the, and it was a series on great, the great houses of England. And the marquee estate was a uh, high clear castle where um, Downton Abbey was filmed. Pretty um, sure we watched that. Yeah. And but one of the one of the the estates that got its own episode an hour was Chatsworth House, which for centuries has been the seat of the Dukes of Devonshire. And so they do the whole 400 year history of the house. And for a few minutes of the hour, they talked about how John F. Kennedy's younger sister, Kick, stood to potentially inherit the house as the future Duchess of Devonshire if she married the future Duke, Billy Hardington but that her romance with Billy was opposed by both of their families because she was a Catholic and he was a Protestant. And I just thought to myself, wow, that sounds like a great story. <laughs> and the next day I fell down a Google rabbit hole, um, you know, looking up uh, things about kick. And I, I, I just immediately saw that her story was fascinating and interesting, but I couldn't, for a whole bunch of different reasons, I couldn't devote myself to it at that time. Um, for one thing, I was actually under contract to write, this is not a writing manual. So I actually, I, that was a, a task I needed to complete first. Um, but, you know, once I did start researching her story in earnest, I saw that I could write a book that was like the Paris wife um, about her life. When you when you find historical events like this and 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 people and you start seeing the the mystery around it, um, I know you you say that you're you're not a mystery writer, but there's there's a a bit of that that comes with um, these uh, these sort of unfinished stories because that's what fascinates us about it is is why why did this happen? Uh, how did how does someone come this close to um, you know, to this event and it, because the, these characters are sort of relegated to the background of history and the, you know, all of the possibilities start rolling around in our minds. Um, what was it about, about her and her story that, uh, that grabbed your attention? Well, it was, it was that sort of that tension, um, you know, that she wasn't a lot, she, she wasn't allowed to marry the guy she wanted to marry. I mean, that's, that was, inherently interesting to me. Right. Um, you know, she was also, um, I had a few things like personal things in common with her that I, I, I just immediately felt, uh, you know, an affinity with her story. I was also raised Catholic sort of of an, of an Irish variety. Um, so I knew 
sort of what those tensions would be in her family and her life. I mean, she was a deeply religious girl. I, I am not deeply religious, but I, I see what that looks like. I, I, I understand it. Um, and I understand it sort of from a Catholic point of view. The other thing is I also, when I was about her age, I also lived in London and absolutely loved it. And so I really felt like I deeply understood her um her her own love of london and of england as a country um which extended to her love for uh billy hardington and so you know and then uh, if you had told me that you know 10 years ago that i was going to write what we might call a world war ii novel i would have said you are crazy <laughs> <laughs> um but Learning about Joe's and her father's ambassadorship to England on the eve of World War II was, to me, that was fascinating. You know, somewhere in my memory bank, I think I knew that he was the ambassador, but it was certainly, uh, I mean, once I started reading about it, it just was, it all just felt fresh and new and interesting to me and like something that I wanted to write about. Um, and then, you know, there was also the fact that, you know, so here's Kick. She's 18 years old. She's going to all these parties with these kids who are whose lives are going to be, in, you know, completely changed by the war that's about to hit. So all of that was interesting to me. One thing that I love about good historical fiction is that I am uh, immersed in the story and there's enough um, historical fact that I'm familiar with that I don't constantly um, want to fact check, uh, if you know what I mean. Like, I'm, yep. I'm just completely drawn into the story. It feels familiar enough to me that um, I, I feel like I'm living through the character and watching scenes that I'm vaguely familiar with. Um, as a writer, how do you get to that point um, in choosing what things to include, what things to completely make up? And, you know, I, I'm I am in awe of the work that, that you guys do in in this uh, in this genre. Um, how do you figure out where the canvas is and what you get to bring in that's already exist? You know, that's such a good question. And, you know, I I, I can only speak for myself. Um, so I, I start with the research and I, I don't I don't start with the writing. So I. I really try to do as much reading as I can, and I take a lot of notes while I read. And I try to basically what what I wind up with is a um, long word document that is pretty much arranged um, chronologically. So, like my headings will be like years and months. And what I'm able to kind of start seeing are the the major events. Like what, what are the, the major events in this character's life that I really cannot ignore, right? And that I must, I must figure out how to maneuver the character between one event and another. And that, that's really where the imagination takes place, right? Like you can't do anything about the events. <laughs> um, but like, what did it feel like in Kick's case, to be to be a debutante in 1938, um, you know, what did it feel like uh, to live through the you know the early events um, of of the Nazi regime that her with her father being the ambassador, and um, you know, in Grace Kelly's case, you know, what did it feel like to leave Philadelphia at not even 18 years old, um, to enroll in the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, um, to train to be a Broadway actress. Like, what did that feel like? And, and what did it feel like um, to discover that actually Hollywood wanted you more than Broadway? You know, that wasn't ever something that she set out to. She didn't set out to be a Hollywood star at all. She wanted to be on the on stage in New York. And that's what she trained for. So, you know, you, it's I. I get to take the the facts and imagine what it must have felt like to live through those things. Well, with your first novel being on the cusp of World War II and dealing with the Kennedys, um, you know that's a, that's a bit like American royalty, uh, <laughs> if you want. Um, that's a great place to start uh, writing historical fiction. Uh, there's there's a lot there for a very broad audience to to latch on to. Um, when you follow up a book like that with the girl in white gloves, um, how do you decide was, uh, did, did Grace Kelly, were you thinking about her already? Were you thinking about a, another iconic figure that you could explore? Um, how did you come to the person of Grace Kelly? 
Well, so I grew up with Grace Kelly's movies. My mom was a huge Alfred Hitchcock fan, and two of her favorites were Rear Window and To Catch a Thief. So those movies were part of my growing up. And I had, you know, I knew I, when I finished The Kennedy Debutante, I kind of, what I knew was that I wanted to write in the middle of the 20th century, but I didn't have a person in mind yet. And I certainly wasn't thinking how can I write about more American royalty? That was, that was sort of like a happy accident <laughs> that it turned out that way. Um, but, uh, you know, I, uh, Grace Kelly came to my mind very quickly, I think, because again, I, I grew up watching her movies and uh, you know, I, there were questions to me about her life. I wondered, I had some sense that she had made these movies in the fifties, but not later. And so I was like, well, why, like, why did she stop making movies? I knew that she had married a prince, but, I, and I was like, well, what was that like? I mean, what was it like to be an American girl who marries a prince and lives in Europe for the rest of your life? And that's the point at which like my novel brain, novelist brain kicks in and is like, Oh, maybe these would be interesting questions to explore in a novel. And and in the case of Grace Kelly, it really did turn out to be the case. Like, you know, she just got more and more interesting to me the more I learned about her. So, um, and like I said, it was sort of a, sort of an interesting and happy accident that I went from one American Royal family to another. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't planned. I promise. <laughs> there's, there's so much interest right now. Uh, the last three or four years, um, have have seen an explosion of interest in historical fiction, especially around the 20th century and that the mid 20th century or so World War II uh, and just slightly before and just slightly after uh, are just kind of white hot right now. And, um, you know, both of your novels explore, you know, this this time period. Um, what do you think it is that is drawing so many readers to this time period and to stories um, that are bringing some of these characters alive? Um, you know, I, I, it's such an interesting question. I could talk about that for a whole other hour. Um, I think in the case of World War II, um, I think I came to feel like World War II as a, as a time period and as a genre um, is like the Middle Ages or ancient Rome. I think we are always going to be telling stories that take place during World War II. I don't think it will ever get old to people. Um, you know, it's such a time of heightened emotion and heroism, and there are just so many stories still waiting to be told. Um, it just seems at this point almost inexhaustible. Um, and, and, you know, it's funny if you, again, to the point I made earlier, 10 years ago, I might not have thought that because, you know, we were only getting stories of the Holocaust at that point, which isn't, just, I mean, those are important stories that need to be told and retold. But now, like World War II, we're now seeing, you know, stories about the nurses and the Red Cross girls and, you know, the French resistance. You know, there's so, I mean, it's like I said, it just feels inexhaustible um, as a time period. And I think because, you know, the 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 middle of the 20th century the the sort of the 50s and now into the 60s um is is historic enough to qualify as historical fiction um people are really excited to start exploring that time period um through novels and movies um and i think we're going to con just continue to see more interesting um work done uh, uh, looking at the middle of the century. Do you watch the Marvel as Mrs. Maisel? Oh, that is that my wife and I binged the, the latest yeah. season, the, the weekend it released. Yeah. That is yeah. Our, that's our favorite show. Yeah. So I, I think we're going to be interested in that for a while because as history, as history, it's new, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and we're losing so many people of that generation uh, now. So like my grandparents, um, were were that generation, and I remember you know, talking to my grandfather and my great uncles, um, and in hearing stories. But you know, they they are all gone now, and mm -hmm. um, so you know, every day we see a headline. You know, the last um, you know member of of this um, you know group that did this thing died today, and uh, right. and we're, I mean, it, it, the the uh, the personal stories are slipping through our fingers, and I think that's. One thing that we're longing for is to to capture more of those personal stories. Yeah, I think that, yes, I couldn't have said it better myself. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. 
So um, the girl in, in white gloves, um, what, were, what was one of the things that surprised you the most about Grace Kelly? Um, and what was one of the, the most fun things that you got to write uh, to expand uh, her story a little bit in your mind uh, about a fact that you learned about her? Um, well, I, I'll say, I think it was, it really, I think I've already mentioned it and I touched on it a little bit. It was the fact that she was trained to be a Broadway actress. She was in, the, she went to uh, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Um, she also studied with Sam, Sanford Meissner. Um, and, you know, she, she was an accidental Hollywood star. And, and it was also really fun for me to write scenes um, of her being a young woman in New York City um, in the late 40s and very early 50s before she was famous. Um, those were really fun scenes to write um, because I think not many people know about that part of her life. It was before she was Grace Kelly. Um, and, and, you know, I really got to sort of relax during those scenes too, because I felt like, well, I'm not writing about Alfred Hitchcock yet. I mean, I loved writing those scenes too. Um, but you know, and the other thing that I would say was surprising to me was how modern her life felt to me. You know, when I was, you know, researching and then writing about her, her, you know, her, her early life in New York, it didn't feel that different to me that the life I led in Brooklyn, you know, in the late nineties, uh, early knots, you know, she, she dated, she went to school, she put herself through school, she worked, um, it really, I mean, it was more glamorous than the life I lived in Brooklyn, but it wasn't, it wasn't that different. <laughs> when you're, when you're writing about a historical figure, um, like you have, um, do you ever come upon a, uh, a, a time in their life, a, a situation, maybe a, a rumor, um, that you don't feel comfortable exploring? Um, yeah, I think that that's true for any for any writer of historical fiction. Um, you know, uh, I think yes. <laughs> Um, I think we're all hesitant to write about people who are still alive, you know, and I think that that's a, to, to your point earlier about as people tragically, I mean, sadly do die and pass on, it does make their stories more available to us. Um, uh, Hilary Mantel said in a uh, lecture series that I was looking at recently that the moment you die, your life passes into fiction. So there's something about that. My phone is about to ring here, I think, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, so the book, The Girl in White Gloves, a novel of Grace Kelly, is available everywhere now uh, in, in audiobook, hardcover, Kindle edition. However you uh, read books, you can grab it today. There's a link to it in the show notes. Carrie, if people are just learning about you and want to connect uh, with you, is there a place that they can find you online? Oh, yes. I'm very active on Instagram. And uh, Carrie Mayer Writer. I'm also on Facebook. But I want to put in a plug. You mentioned the audiobook. Um, it, I started listening to it. I listened to a lot of audiobooks. And I started listening to it this morning. Kimberly Farr is the reader. And she is just absolutely fantastic. So if you are an audiobook listener, I, I highly recommend it. Excellent. We'll put links to all of that in the show notes of this episode. Um, Carrie, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you, Hank. I had a great time talking to you today. Stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. The near future. The probe slowed as the sun's heliosphere disrupted the graviton wave it rode in on from the abyss of deep space. Awakened by the sudden deceleration, the probe absorbed the electromagnetic spectrum utilized by its target species and assessed the technological sophistication of the sole sentient species on Earth. The probe adjusted its course to take it into the system's primary. If the humans couldn't survive, with its help, what was to come, then the probe would annihilate itself. There would be no trace of it for the enemy and no chance of humanity's existence beyond the time it had until the enemy arrived. The probe analyzed filed patents, military expenditures, birth rates, mathematical advancement, and space exploration. The first assessment fell within the margin of error of survival and extinction for humanity. The probe's programming allowed for limited, autonomous decision-making 
choice being a rare luxury for the probe's class of artificial intelligence. The probe found itself in a position to choose between ending its mission in the sun's fire and a mathematically improbable defense of humanity, and the potential compromise of its much larger mission. Given the rare opportunity to make its own decision, the probe opted to dither. In the week it took to pass into Jupiter's orbit, the probe took in more data. It scoured the Internet for factors to add to the assessment, but the assessment remained the same. Unlikely, but possible. By the time it shot past Mars, the probe still hadn't made a decision. As the time to adjust course for Earth or continue into the sun approached, the probe conducted a final scan of cloud storage servers for any new information and found something interesting. While the new information made only a negligible impact on the assessment, the probe adjusted course to Earth. It hadn't traveled all this way for nothing. In the desert south of Phoenix, Arizona, it landed with no more fanfare than a slight thump and a few startled cows. Then it broke into the local cell network and made a call. Mark Ibarra awoke to his phone ringing at max volume, playing a pop ditty that he hated with vehemence. He rolled off the mattress that lay on the floor and crawled on his hands and knees to where his cell was recharging. His roommate, who paid the majority of their rent and got to sleep on an actual bed, grumbled and let off a slew of slurred insults. Mark reached his cell and slapped at it until the offending music ended. He blinked sleep from his eyes and tried to focus on the caller's name on the screen. The only people who'd call at this ungodly hour were his family in Bosque country, or maybe Jessica in his applied robotics course, wanted a late-night study break. The name on the screen was Answer Me. He closed an eye and reread the name. It was way too early, or too late, depending on one's point of view, for this nonsense. He turned the ringer off and went back to bed. Sleep was about to claim him when the phone rang again, just as loudly as last time, but now with a disco anthem. Seriously? His roommate slurred. Mark declined the call and powered the phone off. He flopped back on his bed and curled into his blanket. To hell with my first class, he thought. Arizona State University had a lax attendance policy, one which he'd abused for nights like this. The cell erupted with big band music. Mark took his head out from beneath the covers and looked at his phone like it was a thing possessed. The phone vibrated so hard that it practically danced a jig on the floor, and the screen flashed Answer Me over and over again as music blared. Dude, said his roommate, now sitting up in his bed. Mark swiped the phone off the charging cord, and the music stopped. The caller's name undulated with a rainbow of colors, and an arrow appeared on the screen, pointing to the button he had to press to answer the call. When did I get this app? He thought. Mark sighed and left the bedroom, meandering into the hallway bathroom with the grace of a zombie. The battered mattress he slept on played hell with his back and left him stiff every morning. Dropping his boxers, he took a seat on the toilet and answered the call determined to return this caller's civility with some interesting background noise. What? He murmured. Mark Ibarra, I need to see you. The voice was mechanical, asexual in its monotone. Do you have any friggin' idea what time it is? Wait, who the hell is this? You must come to me immediately. We must discuss the mathematical proof you have stored in document title This Can't Be Right. Dot doc. Mark shot to his feet. The boxers around his ankles tripped him up, and he stumbled out of the bathroom and fell against the wall. 
His elbow punched a hole in the drywall, and the cell clattered to the floor. He scooped the phone back up and struggled to breathe as a sudden asthma attack came over him. <laughs> how? How? He couldn't finish his question until he found his inhaler in the kitchen mere steps away in the tiny apartment. He took a deep breath from the inhaler and felt the tightness leave his lungs. That someone knew of his proof was impossible. He'd finished it earlier that night and had encrypted it several times before loading it into a cloud file that shouldn't have been linked to him in any way. How do you know about that? he asked. You must come to me immediately. There is little time. Look at your screen, the robotic voice said. His screen changed to a map program, displaying a pin in an open field just off the highway, connecting Phoenix to the suburb of Maricopa. Come. Now. Mark grabbed his keys. An hour later, his jeans ripped from scaling a barbed wire fence, Mark was surrounded by desert scrub. The blue of the morning rose behind him where his beat-up Honda waited on the side of the highway. With his cell to it... Some things you write now, uh, do they differ in the writing process from... Uh, from Plants looked a lot like benign mesquite trees in the darkness. A Native American casino in the distance served as his north star, helping him keep his bearings. You're not out here, are you? I'm being punked, aren't I? he asked the mysterious caller. You are 9.26 meters to my east-southeast. Punk. Decayed wood. Used as tinder. Are you on fire? The caller said. Mark rolled his eyes. This wasn't the first time the caller had used the non-standard meanings of words during what passed as conversation between the two. Mark had tried to get the caller to explain how he knew about his theorem and why they had to meet in the middle of the desert. The caller had refused to say anything. He would only reiterate that Mark had to come quickly to see him, chiding him every time Mark deviated from the provided driving directions. If you're so close, why can't I see you? He asked. He took a few steps in what he thought was a northwesterly direction and squished into a cow patty.